Over the last two years, we've been able to bring over 400 works into this collection, a combination of purchases and gifts. Gifts have always been a very important way that our collection has grown. We are fortunate among museums in this country to have great collectors who work in almost every area that is represented in our collection, and the results of those strong relationships with collectors are manifest in the works that have come into the collection. One of the bittersweet events of the last two years was the retirement of our longtime decorative arts curator, Julie Emerson, who built the department and brought in so many great acquisitions for our collection in the 37 years that she was at SAM. One of the positive outcomes of that bittersweet retirement was the acquisition of some really important works from the funds that she had built up over her time here. One of the real milestone acquisitions is a piece from 1750 created by the Bow Porcelain Manufactory in England. These pieces are exceedingly rare. They're from the birth of European porcelain. And of course, as you can see, it embodies the airiness and the playfulness and beauty of the Rococo style. It is a centerpiece that now takes its place in the center of our celebrated porcelain room where you can see it on view. Another exciting milestone acquisition that Julie was able to bring in was this beautiful corner cabinet by the English architect and designer Edward William Godwin from about 1875. It's a beautiful representation of the aesthetic movement which arose in England to kind of counter the arts and crafts movement with its sense of moral righteousness and it was really about beauty and the kind of spidery design that is amplified through the use of mirrors makes it a very dynamic and elegant piece of furniture which is currently on view now in our 19th century gallery. This acquisition was funded through decorative arts funds but also through a significant bequest from Mary Lou Everett who was a longtime member of the Decorative Arts and Painting Council. The centerpiece of our European Decorative Arts collection is, of course, our great porcelain room. And that represents the collective collecting efforts of a group called the Seattle Ceramic Society, which was active since the 1940s. Frances McDougall had a collection of almost 200 works, of which Julie chose a selection of about 14 works, which represent new forms and models for the porcelain room. These works came to us as a gift from Frances McDougall's granddaughter, Catherine Cassoni Quinn. And it's the last of the society gifts that finally completes the work of the Seattle Ceramic Society, which has been so instrumental in the formation of our collection. Many of you will know this door well. It's been on view at the museum since 1991 when we first opened the Venturi building downtown. And this represents a really significant acquisition for the museum. We've had it on view for so long because it is so crucial to telling the important story of East meets West, which is so much a foundation of our decorative arts collection. The door was a generous gift from Richard Brown in honor of Julie Emerson. We are fortunate to have a fantastic collection of American silver. We have fewer works from England and the continent and so we're very glad to be able to add this important hot water jug and warmer stand created by the celebrated British silversmith, Paul Storr. And it comes to us as a gift from Herman and Faye Sarkowski in honor of Julie Emerson. Akio Takamori is an internationally renowned ceramic artist who until his recent retirement was part of the celebrated ceramics faculty at the University of Washington. And we are fortunate to have a number of works by him in our collection, including this wonderful new group of village people that will be going on view in the near future. They will be a wonderful addition to our galleries and this work was notable for being a collaborative acquisition between the modern and contemporary, Asian, and decorative arts departments. Ruth J. Nutt was a longtime friend to the museum. She became close friends with Julie Emerson and helped us present an important selection of American silver, which was the heart of her great collection of American art. So that has been on view at the museum since 1991. With her passing in recent years, 
A bequest was made by the family to the museum's collection, which really honors that long relationship that we had with Ruth. And some of the highlights are in American silver, but she also collected wonderful works of furniture, needlepoint, and painting. We are honored to bring in about 45 great works that make us instantly one of the premier collections of American silver in the country. And these works are on view in the third floor American galleries. This past year, we've had two major acquisitions to the American Art Collection. One is a work that really completes our holding by Mark Toby. This very sort of quirky, eccentric, mesmerizing portrait of Martha Graham that was done in 1928 before Martha Graham was Martha Graham, the Martha Graham that we know today, when she was really just coming on the scene. This was the unveiling of her first truly modernist ballet called The Poems of 1917, set to piano music by Leo Ornstein. It was a series of positions that evoked ancient wooden sculpture. So she sits before us like an ancient votive figure, wide-eyed, wild-eyed, uh, really looks very static and sculptural. And this was the way the dance impressed the critic that evening and must have impressed Toby as well. Gifts from the Kendrick Schlatter estate also helped to make possible the purchase of Raphael Peel's Still Life with Strawberries and Ostrich Egg Cup. This very small painting has an enormously large label that acknowledges all of the donors who stepped up over the course of three years to make this acquisition possible for the Seattle Art Museum. I've come to think of Raphael Peel as a chronicler of his time and of his world, really, in Philadelphia in 1814. And he tells stories through things. So in this picture, he shows us prized strawberries. And he's situated them between an exotic ostrich egg from Africa. And he's showing them arrayed on exotic, costly porcelains from China. He also tells us from an inscription on the picture that these strawberries have been on the vine into June of 1814 when he painted this picture. So they've grown large and undoubtedly sweet. And he has given them center stage in this story about his view of the world with New World strawberries occupying as prominent a place as Old World Googaws, as one commentator in the early 19th century called them. It is an amazing kind of atlas of the world as Raphael Peel knew it in 1814. This is the smallest painting in the American art galleries, but the story that it tells in America's art history is very large. Several of the acquisitions have come out of major exhibitions we've done here at SAM, and they serve as a legacy for those exhibitions. As part of the acquisitions for this past year, we have a group of three objects by the renowned Haida artist Robert Davidson. The first one is a wonderful painting that was done in 2010 called Canoe Breaker, Southeast Wind's Brother. We're happy to have this particular painting because Southeast Wind figures very prominently in Robert's repertoire, but also in Haida myths about the powerful nature of the winds and the climate in the Haida Gwaii archipelago. And so many of the oral traditions feature this powerful individual. Canoe Breaker, Southeast Wind's brother, was a gift of the McRae Foundation and the Native Arts Council. The second piece by Robert Davidson is a silkscreen print entitled You and I, which was based on the painting that we had in the exhibition, Abstract Impulse. And it shows the ways in which Robert continues to incorporate the older ethos of Haida art, but also expand from it into new directions. This was a gift of Nancy and Hamilton Harris. And the third piece, Eagle Shawl Color Coat, was a collaborative effort between Robert Davidson and Dorothy Grant. 
and it represents their movement of Haida art into the haute couture realm under their label Feastwear. This beautiful modern coat with a Northwest Coast design on it greatly supplements the traditional textiles we have in the collection and speaks to our viewers that these traditions are living and vital and continually being innovated. Another gift this past year was 41 Northwest Coast native silkscreen prints given by longtime supporter Simon Ottenberg. He has very generously, since 2005, given over 115 silkscreen prints to the museum that represent not just a large group of Coast Salish artists, but reaches all the way back to the beginnings of printmaking on the Northwest Coast, the late 1970s. So we are really grateful to Simon for growing this print collection for us in this very important medium, one that Native artists continue to embrace. To supplement our Northwest Coast print collection, we have a new gift by Greg Colfax. Most of the prints in our print collection are singular objects. And with this gift by Doug and Thelma McTavish, we have the opportunity to have a series of prints that tells a macaw story about the hunter and the wolves. We also have a new acquisition from outside the Northwest Coast region with a beautiful ceramic plate made by the famed Pueblo potter Maria Martinez and her son Popovi Day. Maria is the most renowned Native American potter of the 20th century, and our piece is a very beautiful gunmetal sheen plate with a radial feather design. This is the gift of Michael and Leslie Ray Bernstein. This is a work that will be shared between the Modern Contemporary Department and the Native American Department. Brian Youngen is an internationally acclaimed artist who has First Nations heritage, and he draws upon this heritage in many of his works in very creative ways. And we see this in the piece, The Mom Call. For this particular piece, he has used the chair as the starting point, and then very lyrically stretched the hide and laced the chair. So he has, in essence, created a drum out of a classic piece of furniture. This is a much appreciated acquisition by the Contemporary Collectors Forum. During this term, we acquired an extraordinary textile by a young artist from Azerbaijan. Vag Ahmed, who's trained in both painting and sculpture, is now really focusing on textiles and on installations. The work that we acquired, called oiling, really mixes the traditional Persian carpet weaving techniques with modern painting techniques. As you move from top to bottom, you can see the surface dissolving, taking these traditions of East and West, of historic and modern. This artist is one of the really exciting artists coming out of the Middle East, and is also indicative of the kinds of young artists that Sam is now acquiring. Our collection of Japanese ukiyo prints, one of the most popular genres in Japanese art, keeps growing. In the past two years, 18 prints from Ellen and Mary Collar were accessioned into the collection. They include representative works by Halonobu, actor prints by Shalako and Shinsho, and also beautiful courtesan prints. We also acquired five prints with the support of Asian Art Found. The two triptychs by Kuniyoshi, both printed in the early 19th century, are for of drama. The one titled The Earth Spider is actually drawn from a novel play of the same title. Another notable work is a rare first edition print of Three Geisha by Kobayashi Kiyochika, printed in 1877. The oval shape, the black and white printing, as well as shading on the faces, all make references to photography, which was a normal art form in Japan at the time. Esther Fallick, a long-time Sam member and supporter, gave us 20 exquisite Japanese baskets. 
A selection of them will be on view this May in the installation titled Tea Ensemble. In the area of Korean art, thanks to the support of enthusiastic collectors like Frank Bailey, wonderful works entered the collection. One is a printed map of Seoul dated to the early 19th century. For Chinese art, we received wonderful gifts of painting calligraphy, including two in honor of former Chinese curator Josh Yi. We also acquired a contemporary work titled Ink Media, a video and a set of ink drawings. This is the artist Chen Shaoxiong's most recent work. With about 150 images he hand-painted, Chen created this video which is a powerful montage of depictions of protest and social action. For Sam, this is a perfect work that embodies the present and the past. The range of art from Africa that has been acquired in the last two years is really taking us from the 20th century into the 21st century and up to the present moment. Both Mark Rudine and Cynthia Putnam keep providing us with amazing repository of art from the 20th century, including two of my favorite masks of recent note who are both from the Ijo people. Uh, Ijo people live in the Niger Delta region where there's so much water and stream life that they have conceived of the notion that there are these underground towns where the masqueraders come up as kind of emissaries and can both delight and destroy the social fabric by the way they encounter you. So imagine having this face come up with pop eyes and a big long snout and even longer horns to startle you and kind of get you to jumpstart realizing there's a whole nother world under the water that you're looking at. But we also, from Mark and Cynthia again, got one of the prettiest faces imaginable from the Igbo of Nigeria. It's a young woman, a maiden, whose face has been totally chalked white as a sign of serenity. From the other side of femininity, we have a piece that is a sculpture by the Chokwe. And I always laugh when I look at it because it kind of seems like she's concentrating very hard with her eyes closed, trying to figure out how she's going to control the longest, most awkward limbs you could ever imagine. And yet she presides over it with this serene smile on her face. Then we move from Tanzania into Gabon. And from Dr. Oliver Cobb and his wife Pamela came a very august face that is of a reliquary, of a type that was meant to guard the bones of the greatest ancestors. And this is one that is probably about 100 years old. And there are very few of these that were collected before missionaries moved into the region. And now we have this truly remarkable example that is of the high order of what the Coda are capable of in sculpture. From Al and Shirley Nicholson came a wonderful little crowd of Ibeji figures. These are figures that come from the Yoruba culture of Nigeria, where these figures are carved to commemorate a twin who dies. But it commemorates the twins, but also shows us the range of ways that Yoruba carvers can animate these small figures and make them a part of the family and they are endearing, but also give us a sense of the reverence for the young ones who have passed on. From the 21st century, we get to move into a woman of a very different nature than those from the 20th. This is a woman who's called a signare. She's posed very purposely in the middle of a governor's palace on the island of Gore in Senegal. Gore Island is where slavery was seen at its height. And she was one of the Senegalese women who would walk into the governor's palace to seduce men. And women dress like this in a kind of reconstruction of the past. The artist who took this photograph is Fabrice Montero. 
and he began staging a new awareness of the different characters that make up Senegalese history. With the evolution of work on the Disguise exhibition, one of the artists who is identified from the beginning as being on the top of our list is a South African artist named Nandifa Mantambo. And through two works that have just entered the collection, we're able to give you a preview of what is to come with that exhibition. Our major ally in this arena is Joseph Askovitz, and he and Lisa Goodman have provided us with a photograph where she's standing in the middle of a stadium in Maputo, Mozambique, and she is posed as a bullfighter. It was a way to confront her own internal struggle of having an animalistic side in her, so she becomes both the fighter and the bull at the same time. On the other hand, Nandifa is also quite enthralled with the role that cows have in all of our lives. So in this piece that shows her rear end being modeled with cow hide, she's able to freeze a moment with a cow that I don't think many of us have had in a gallery before. But she commanded that process to come up with this vision of a hide that's covering her and forcing us to reckon with both the macabre and the beautiful at the same time. This has been one of the most extraordinary years for our collection of modern and contemporary art. We started the year with an incredible acquisition and gift by Barney Epsworth to the Olympic Sculpture Park. John Plenza's Echo has, of course, been dominating the skyline there ever since last spring. We've had tremendous response from visitors, so this is an extraordinary new piece for us, and we're so grateful to Barney. We had, of course, also in the Olympic Sculpture Park last summer, the beautiful Ginny Ruffner bench, which she had designed for a very particular place in the Sculpture Park, overlooking not only the park itself, but out onto Puget Sound. That bench was dedicated in memory of Mary Shirley, who was, of course, such a huge force in the creation of the Sculpture Park in a place that she dearly loved. Also last spring, we received an incredible gift by Gladys and Sam Rubenstein. They had been collecting European avant-garde, early 20th century art, especially strong in geometric abstraction, works by artists such as Robert and Sonia Delaunay, by Yavlensky, by Derain, and many others, none of whom had been in our collection before. The collection is also quite strong in artists who were close to the orbit of surrealism, with people like André Masson, Jean Miro, Max Ernst and others, you will have already been able to see a selection of these works in the newly dedicated gallery on the third floor and you can expect to see many others in the years to come. This last year Sam was also able to add several key works by important artists from Seattle. In the winter, we had several sculptures by Buster Simpson that we acquired for the collection, and a few of those are actually on view right now as part of the Duchamp Effect installation. We also were able to purchase a fantastic relief piece by Leo Burke for the collection. He was the previous year's Betty Bowen Award winner. And just this spring, thanks to the generosity of Matthew Offenbacher and his wife, Jennifer Nemhauser, they set aside money that Matthew had received from an art prize the previous year, and we were able to purchase, in close collaboration, a group of uh, six works by important um, artists living and working in Seattle right now. So this is a new and fresh generation, and the group of works are arranged around themes of feminism, gender issues, women issues. It's a fantastic group and we'll be able to put it to really great use here in the galleries. This last year we were also able to purchase several uh, works by artists of color for uh, Sam's collection in honor of Sandra Jackson Dumont. And the first was an acquisition of five photographs by Latoya Ruby Fraser. As you'll remember, she was, of course, the previous recipient of the Jacob Lawrence Fellowship. And it's a fantastic group of works for our collection. 
We had a couple of other acquisitions that are going to diversify our collection. Among them, uh, Michelaine Thomas, we just acquired a major 30-piece panel work by her called Hair Portrait Number no. 20. Some of you will remember it from the Pop de Portraits exhibition because it was, of course, a very important work in the context of that show. Also, in honor of Sandra Jackson Dumont, Constance and Norman Rice gave to the museum another one of the beautiful Whitfield Lovell reliefs. So we we're very pleased with this gift. We were also surprised this last year by some wonderful gifts that came to us by sheer surprise. The Andy Warhol Foundation came back to us and offered us one of those truly precious little red books, which are compendia of uh, photographs that Andy Warhol took on one particular evening. In this case, it includes a whole roster of Italian film people, and it's a little time capsule. It is a uh, precious but very important work and we'll be able to put it to really excellent use in the coming years. This year, Greg Cusera donated two beautiful prints to the Seattle Art Museum. One is a Tara Donovan, um, beautiful, delicate composition made out of soap bubbles, so ephemeral and yet so striking in its use of abstraction. And the other is a Gary Simmons print of a spinning chandelier. Two beautiful works by artists we do not have in the collection yet, so these are beautiful new additions as well. In terms of purchases, there were another set of key works which I have to share with you. One, of course, is the famous Ai Weiwei colored vases piece from the Shields estate. Of course, he as an artist is very political. And so this combination of using ceramics that have a very long and ancient tradition in China with a very casual, almost Jackson Pollock-like dipping in paint utterly transforms these artworks and makes a very important point. So we're extremely happy to finally have him in our collection. This fall, we were also able to purchase a lovely drawing by a very important uh, Los Angeles artist, Raymond Pettibone, with funds from the Contemporary Art Council. It's the Bevoom character who is uh, joyfully screaming into the landscape. There are many other works which you will be able to see or have been seeing already, including the Lynette uh, Yadomwaki painting of a dancer that adorns the forum right now, as well as the beautiful suite of collages by William Cordova, which we also acquired last winter. So in areas large and small, we've been able to make great strides, add new works to the collection. And in the fall, Virginia Wright surprised us with the most incredible gift I could imagine. Some 80 artworks, more actually, from her and her late uh, husband's collection. As you all know, Virginia and Bagley had been collecting since the 1950s, had been collecting modernist art by great artists such as Frank Stella and uh, Andy Warhol and Rothko and Frankenthaler. The list goes on and on. And what we have with this incredible uh, gift is a true transformation of our collection. We have not only now one of the premier collections of mid-century modern artwork in an American collection here, but the gift extends far beyond that into the 1980s, 90s and into the 2000s. And you have already some of these new gifts in the galleries right now. Jasper John's thermometer, a big favorite of course, and James Rosenquist tumbleweed as are major paintings by Eric Fischel and David Sally, all of them part of this new gift. What the collection does, it has such strength, not only with an individual artist, but with entire groups. So it's not only adding a piece here and there, but truly transforming our collection. It's been a truly transformative year for all of us here at the museum and especially in the modern and contemporary collections and I'm very excited to show you many more of our treasures in the years to come.